Um, <clears throat> I have to say, I feel a little bit as though I'm coming in at this as a stranger to this area. Um, it's not, uh, uh, I haven't worked in depth in this general area of recreation, participation, engagement, and so on, amongst children and young people. Um, my day job is really to do with um, residential outdoor education and um, a few things around adventure sports. Uh, but uh, with that research some context, I started to look more widely uh, around the general area of uh, engagement and participation uh, by children and young people. And that's really where I'm coming from. Um, what you'll find as I go through is that uh, yeah. what you find as I go through is that a lot of what I'm going to say links back to other or links forward even to other presentations. <coughs> and I was beginning to feel really quite reassured um, over the piece that uh, we're seeing some common features that uh, are in and um, well specifically what I'm looking at here are measures. And um, in, in the first presentation, we saw quite a bit about measures. In um, Catherine Ward Thompson's presentation, we saw a little bit about measures. And what we'll see is that they are coming together. So these measures um, that I'm going to talk about actually come from uh, a very wide range of aspects of looking at the outdoors. And that's deliberate, actually. Um, I've probably looked through, as you would have done, you know, 20, 30, 40 different sources of data. And um, you can't possibly show all of them or even thoroughly review them in this presentation. So what I'm showing you is just a few examples. I'm showing you a few examples. Showing you a few examples um, from all these different uh, sources of data, academic research, government agencies, youth groups, and so on. There tends to be a bit of a focus on what's going on in Scotland, but actually, as you'll see, a lot of the data comes from beyond Scotland. And towards the end, I'll say a little bit um, about what I perceive, anyway, in terms of barriers and opportunities in outdoor participation and reasons to be optimistic about. Um, this increase in, in, into the future. So, okay. this is just to remind us that what I'm talking about is leisure time, free time amongst children and young people, nothing to do with what they um, get out of their school time. And uh, being a, an orienteer, one of the things I went to first of all was a uh, um, database on the membership of British Orienteering, which is the national government body for orienteering in the UK. And uh, looking down at the, at the um, young age end of this spectrum, um, I was very struck by this peak, which as I say, it chimes with what a lot of other people have been saying here this morning. Uh, but it rises uh, through uh, primary school years, and then at about 14, it suddenly dives. Um, and this is probably due to the fact that, to begin with, young people come with their families and then when they get to 14, they get to the stage where they want to do their own thing and even though the families continue to come orienteering, the youngsters don't join them. And, um, so I looked a little bit more widely at this data set. That, that data set, the 20... Right. Um, The vertical bars are 2018. Um, I look back to the year 2000 um, at the membership and you get exactly the same pattern. And in fact, the data I have goes back to the 1990s, well actually back to 1990. And you see exactly the same pattern again. So it's a picture that's persisted for about 30 years in this particular case. Um, now looking at something very different, and uh, we've heard about the connectedness to nature index before this morning. Unfortunately, this shows exactly the same as the one we saw earlier, but it comes from a different source. Um, this is an RSPB database on connectedness to nature. Um, completely different way of looking at outdoor recreation and participation. 
And you can see here how it declines quite markedly, in fact, quite worryingly, that it declines from about five years old and bottoms out at about 15 or 16 and then grows again into old age. And just to give you an idea of what these numbers on the left hand side mean, the RSPB had in a different survey calculated that at about this point here, 21% of 8 to 12 year olds are connected to nature by their particular survey methodology. Um, moving on to a, another data set, um, and looking even more widely, this is actually an Australian one, and uh, it comes from the first decade of this century, so between 2000 and 2010. Um, and the reason I, I'm showing this is that, although it's well away from our sphere of interest, um, it is a longitudinal survey following these two cohorts of school kids over a five or six year period. And uh, what we have up the vertical axis here is the time spent outdoors in tens of minutes per week. Um, so two things clear here. One is that one is that we see the decline that we've seen in all the other survey data um, through, in this case again, from five years old, which is quite worrying, um, between five and ten in that cohort, between eleven and sixteen in this cohort. And the other thing that struck me is quite interesting is that being Australia, of course, um, these graphs boil down to spending something like 100 minutes per day outdoors. So it's nearly two hours a day these Australian kids spend outdoors. I went and had a look to see what the equivalent would be in the UK. And um, it's about 60 or 70 minutes a day um, that kids uh, spend in the outdoors. Okay, so this is a one close to home from Scotland. It's um, based on data from a Scottish Natural Heritage. Sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. They're also close together. Um, it's a Scottish Natural Heritage report, and it was from a survey done in 2011 um, on 11 to 17 year olds uh, across a very wide demographic. So it's genders, ethnicities, um, levels of deprivation, regions in Scotland and so on. So demographics very wide. And on this graph here, I've plotted a number of um, aspects of engaging with the outdoors that SNH or the survey company posed to these participants, 1,200 participants in this kind of way. Uh, to begin with, I'd just like to have a look at these top um, curves up here. And there's a grey one, a green one, including the orange one as well. These um, were all testing to what extent the young people actually enjoy or appreciate the benefits essentially of going outdoors. And some of, some of the percentages are exceedingly high. You know, 80, 90, <coughs> even over 90 percent of young people were responding positively to questions about do they like going outdoors, do they like engaging with the outdoors. Um, and in fact, a little bit of statistics show that the responses in these three areas actually correlate together very nicely, correlate positively. So we're getting a consistent picture of a relatively high level amongst young people and children of appreciating the benefits of going outdoors. But when you look lower down and you look at the red and the blue, the red is having membership of at activity clubs or outdoor sports, and blue uh, it's a funny one really because actually it's a measure of how the children rate the time doing things outdoors as one of their most enjoyable free time activities. So although they say most of them, at least 70, 80, 90 percent, seem to appreciate the benefits of going outdoors, when they go outdoors to do something, they don't seem to enjoy it very much. Um, so that, that, that actually is, is rather puzzling. Um, but just drilling down a little bit on that, um, the SNH identified uh, two ways in which kids might go outdoors. One they call simple pleasures, which is going for a walk, taking a dog, having a picnic, um, going and chatting with their friends and so on. And another one, what they call activity-based activities, which were things like horse riding, 
in the snow sports, um, I, I, mountain bike riding, going for a run, that sort of thing. And when you start looking at this, um, I do apologize. Uh, when you start looking at this in a little bit more detail, um, you find that pretty much all of the young people and children like going outdoors, enjoy going outdoors for these simple pleasures, chatting and just walking the dog and getting away from the family and that sort of thing. But when it comes to activity-based pursuits, then it drops dramatically. So that these down here are you know, 20, 30 percent or more um, in terms of positive responses uh, from those at the top there. Right. Now the last one of these graphs is uh, relates to the scout movement. And I was actually present at the presentation by scouts a while back, and it, it, um, I was very impressed actually with what they said. So I went and had a look at their data from Scout uh, annual reports here, so it's very reliable data, and it dates back to 2007, 2008. And what you see first of all is the same peaking at this 8 to 10, 10 to 14 years of age. That's, um, that's beavers, that's cubs, that's scouts, that's explorers. Uh, <clears throat> what you also see is the increase in membership over the years. 7, 8 is the dark blue one, and 18, 19 is the light blue one at the top. So Scouts is actually growing in membership, and it's growing in membership so fast that they can't actually cater for all the people who want to join Scouts. There's a waiting <coughs> list of about 50 or 60,000. Um, the, uh, the, other, the other thing that this shows are these absolute percentages of the age cohort amongst children and young people who are engaged with scouts. And it's a relatively small percentage, 5 or 10 percent, is, uh, is quite common across a number of outdoor related organisations like scouts, Duke of Edinburgh, John Muir Award, Girl Guides, Women's Trust, and those sorts of things. RSPB, the measurements are all down at this um, 5 or 10 percent level. Um, but of course, if you add up all the people who are, all the, these young people who are members of all those different organisations, the total percentage engaged in an outdoor organisation of some sort or other is probably much higher, 40, 50 percent of that. Okay, so this is a summary of those measures. Um, there is a high level of consistency between different sources of information, widely disparate sources of information. There seems to be a widespread appreciation. Appreciation differs depending on uh, how that is put into practice, depends on whether you're talking about simple pleasures or activities. Uh, individual organisations have a relatively low membership. Um, participation declines in teenage years. Um, and uh, on the other hand, many outdoor organisations are actually seeing growth at the moment. Now this goes back to scouts because I was impressed by the way they've grown. <coughs> this graph here is the long term history of the membership of scouts. And these blue dots here <coughs> are the information transferred from that previous slide. Um, the graph, I think, includes adult members as well as children and young people. Uh, however, what you notice is that from about 2005, it has grown dramatically. And over on the left here are the um, actions that Scouts put into practice uh, back in 2005 to turn themselves around from a falling membership to a rising membership. And uh, particularly, I uh, think it's impressive is that they um, recruited, went to recruit from inner cities and deprived areas, multicultural um, communities, and they made their badge offerings much more relevant <coughs> to the modern issues facing young people. Um, so, lastly, the barriers and opportunities, and then a quick look at uh, uh, reasons to be optimistic. So there are dozens of different sources I could have gone to to find out about barriers, but I've just chosen on this one to look at uh, something called the Wild Network. 
and they recognise these four barriers to going outdoors amongst young people. And this one is quite interesting because we've heard a bit about social media already this morning. And what struck me as interesting is that the growth among scouts who have read the Red Empire and so on more or less coincides with the rise in the use of social media um, from about 2005. So I deduce from that that although social media is seen as a barrier, it also, also serves quite well in getting people engaged with these outdoor related organisations. And finally, um, reasons to be optimistic. Children and young people uh, do recognise the benefits of going outdoors. And we have uh, an, an increase, I think, in outdoor learning, outdoor classrooms, learning for sustainability and so on and so forth in various educational environments. Although, um, in an area I'm particularly interested in, it's not very well resourced. Um, I think this is important at the moment in terms of being optimistic. There is plenty of media coverage of something that interests young people, the so-called uh, Greta Thunberg effect, I guess. Um, and although starting from a low baseline, membership of outdoor related organisations is increasing. Um, and I think we are understanding a little bit better about how to address the issues that we 